Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming, even though virtually, to our first Graduate Student Research Day. Graduate Student Research Day of our College of Engineering and Physical Sciences. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for attending, and uh, I also want to thank our organizers, presenters, panelists, judges, spectators, everyone. So as many of you know, our college is a large graduate student population. We have more than 550 students who are doing research and studies in a variety of subjects. As of course you all know, we have five units, School of Engineering, School of Computer Science, Department of Physics, Chemistry, and Mathematics. But uh, some of our programs transcend boundaries of uh, departments and colleges. We also have interdepartmental programs, such as bioinformatics and biophysics. We have coursework and thesis-based programs at the PhD and master's level. And today we are focusing on research, uh, which is done in all these disciplines and across the boundaries. So it's very interdisciplinary collaborative. Our research can be basic, it can be experimental, it can be theoretical, it can be applied. So uh, it is a really good environment to do research because we are so interdisciplinary and you can find almost any kind of research in our college, which is mainly driven by graduate students. So today we are trying this research, uh, graduate student research day for the first time. And uh, it will give uh, us a chance to look at uh, the cutting edge research some of our students are doing. Um, so we will have presentations. Uh, we also have a focus on sustainability today. So we will also have a sustainability panel, which will be chaired by our associate dean external, Bill Van Heist, and uh, will feature some uh, faculty and alumni. Um, so uh, we hope that we will give a chance to um, many of our graduate students to present their research, which will in turn promote collaborations. We will know more about uh, what different uh, research groups are doing. Uh, we will also learn about our partners, industry partners, and alumni. So um, a few words I want to address uh, our graduate students. Uh, we all realize these are very unusual times and it's hard to do research. So I want to give big thanks to everyone who continues doing their research. And uh, I thought about uh, several categories. So I want to thank all of them and people who continue doing research from their homes, whether it will be theoretical or computational, uh, graduate students who came back into the lab, and um, a special category of those who pivoted their research towards uh, fighting the pandemic. So there are all kinds of interesting research and we are trying to sustain it in a safe manner despite all the unusual circumstances. And I want to thank everyone for doing their part, not only for continuing the research, but also for doing it in a safe manner, which is very important these days. So I hope that all graduate students will enjoy learning more about the research which is going on in the college and uh, that it will give a good start to the next year. Uh, so, um, quick review of today's agenda, which is on your screen now. Um, so, we will start with um, three minute uh, student presentations. These are in the format of uh, 3MT competition, which uh, some of you may have attended. Um, so, basically, students will have one slide to present their research in a very accessible 
format so that we will all be able to understand what is that they're doing and what's exciting about it. We will have a panel of judges. Um, so I want to thank again everyone who agreed to uh, do these uh, presentations, which can be stressful. Uh, so during these presentations, as I said, we'll have a panel of judges and at the end we will have um, winners of the first and second place identified. Uh, when you come back at 11.45 after the panel, we will announce those winners. But also during the um, presentations or, or shortly afterwards, we encourage you to send your vote and uh, there will be a link in the chat uh, for people's Choice Award. So we will have three uh, winners, first place, second place, and people's choice. Then uh, following the presentations, we will have a short break. And uh, then after you come back from the break, um, you will be able to participate in the sustainability panel discussion. And as I said, it is chaired by Bill Wen, Professor Bill Wen Heist. Associate Dean of External Relations. And uh, during this panel, you will be able to um, ask questions, and we encourage you to ask questions in the chat as well. Um, and as I mentioned, after the panel, we will, um, we will um, announce the winners, and we will have closing remarks. Um, so basically, this is all I wanted to say, and I will pass the reins to our organizer, um, Kerian McCougan, who is our uh, research communications manager in the college. Thank you again, and uh, enjoy the day, the presentation, and the panel. Okay, thanks so much, Leonid. So we're just uh, getting some of the presenters uh, trickling in. So we'll give it a few more moments um, before 9.15 as our first presenter um, is not yet here, but we'll, uh, we'll wait a few moments and, and, uh, and get started shortly. Okay, so I see our first presenters here. So, uh, Cody, if you don't mind turning on your camera. Okay, I see we're having a little bit of technical issues getting our first presenter rolling. So perhaps we can move on uh, to our second presenter and then we'll come back to Cody. So the first, the second presenter, Mustafa El Kurdi. Mustafa, if you could put on your camera. Perfect.
Okay, when, uh, so Mustafa is presenting forecasting river flow rates using machine learning, and it's co-authored with Andrew Binns in the School of Engineering. So go ahead, Mustafa. All right, thanks. Accurately forecasting a stream's flow rate can have significant socioeconomic implications as it can help optimally manage dams to maintain minimum reservoir levels, which allow for upstream recreational activities and cheap hydropower generation. But more importantly, it can help mitigate flood related losses, which account for the largest portion of losses from natural disasters in Canada. On the left, you can see the city of Calgary with the Bow River meandering through its downtown. Next to it, you can see most of the downtown inundated by water overflowing from the Bow River, causing the costliest flood event in Canadian history, which occurred in July 2013 and resulted in over $1.7 billion in losses. Because stream flow is influenced to various degrees by a wide range of different variables such as temperature and precipitation, just to name a couple, properly predicting stream flow is often a daunting endeavor requiring so much different data. Studies have resorted to machine learning to try to bypass requirements of some of this extensive data with the idea that a machine can learn and reflect the influence of multiple variables without needing to define all their intrinsic complexities. However, studies that aim to use a single time series to learn to predict future values just based on the history of that data, which in this case is just average daily river flow rate, usually suffer from imitation error, which is shown on the right here where a model essentially learns to predict the most recent input it's exposed to. In this case, the six hour model predicts what happened six hours ago. Almost all evaluation metrics tend to overlook this limitation and can reflect very high accuracy, even for time sensitive applications such as flood forecasting, where they might actually be pretty much meaningless. That's why in my model results, I report horizontal error, which measure how well peaks and troughs are predicted at the right time. I trained it and tested a machine learning model called XGBoost, which recent, recently has shown a lot of promise in a wide range of data sets and by winning many machine learning competitions. However, a machine learning model can only learn so much from the data it's given. One interesting approach to obtain more information from a single time series includes decomposing that time series into multiple subcomponents that when summed up equate to the original data. A recently developed example of this is called VMD, and has been used to link specific subcomponents from stream flow to other variables such as climate oscillations. You can see an example of these subcomponents on the left, which I used as additional data for my model and found that it reduced horizontal error by over half, highlighting its effectiveness at predicting dangerously high flows, which are indicative of flooding at the right time. With climate change leading to an increase in the frequency and magnitude of disastrous floods, like the Calgary 2013 event, this machine learning approach to forecast stream flow has the potential to save millions or even billions of dollars from future flood related losses. Thanks. I don't know what I'm at for time, but thanks for listening. <laughs> You're great. So thank you very much, Mustafa. Thanks. So I will uh, finish this off. And I'll give the uh, judges a few moments to uh, to make their assessments. And we'll move next to Troy. Okay, so our next uh, speaker is Troy Kozlowski from the School of Engineering, and his uh, presentation is called High Voltage Atmospheric Cold Plasma on Carbon Dioxide Gas Conversion. So go ahead when you're ready. Have you ever heard of the greenhouse gas called carbon dioxide? Carbon dioxide, or CO2, is a colorless gas consisting of one carbon molecule covalently double bonded to two oxygen molecules. CO2 exists as a trace gas in our atmosphere. However, the concentration of CO2 has been increasing since the Industrial Revolution. It is emitted into our atmosphere by burning hydrocarbon fuels, such as coal, wood, natural gas, and gasoline. My question to you is, why are we wasting all that CO2? CO2 has the potential to be transformed 
back into fuel or commodity chemicals. The secret lies hidden within the CO2 molecule. Stripping a singlet oxygen from carbon dioxide leaves us with carbon monoxide, or CO. Carbon monoxide has a diverse list of industrial uses. To list a few, metal fabrication, residential heating, chemical and pharmaceutical manufacturing, and even electronics production. So all this being said, why do we not collect CO2 from fossil fuel power plants to repurpose the molecule? Carbon dioxide is a very stable molecule, and traditional thermal approaches require a very high temperature of 3,500 degrees Celsius to split CO, to split it into CO and oxygen. It is simply not cost effective to capture CO2 in a fossil fuel smokestack and convert the gas. Other novel approaches of carbon dioxide gas conversion also present challenges, such as expensive catalysts that degrade and high operating costs. They currently don't provide the added value to the process to deem it necessary to capture carbon dioxide. However, I may have a solution. High voltage atmospheric cold plasma, also known as ionized gas. This high energy electron soup has fantastic potential for gas conversion of carbon dioxide. The energetic electrons are generated between two electrodes with an 80 kilovolt difference, and they instantly cleave off oxygen molecules in CO2 at room temperature, which is originally a very thermodynamically difficult reaction to achieve. My early research with a dielectric barrier discharge, or DBD for short, which is a cold plasma generator with two electrodes and an insulating material placed between them, has demonstrated gas conversion efficiency of 4.8% and an energy efficiency of 2.4%. My goal is to discover optimized parameters for the DBD plasma reactor within the next two years to push both efficiencies past 60%. 60% exceeds the thermal equilibrium limit for conversion and reaches an economically feasible energy efficiency. Once I reach my goal, carbon dioxide can cost effectively be pulled from fossil fuel plant emissions, converted into carbon monoxide, and sold back into the industrial market. Thank you. Thanks very much. So I'll just uh, stop the timer. And our next, uh, we'll actually go next to the first presenter for the day. So Cody, I'll just put your video live here. Perfect. So your, what, our next presenter is Cody Cooper-Schmidt from the School of Engineering, and his uh, presentation is called Using Artificial Intelligence to Predict River Channel Migration. So With go ahead summer, you're in. Oh, thanks. With summer behind us and winter quickly coming, I often find myself dreaming of those warm summer days spent lounging on a river bank enjoying a picnic or perhaps doing a bit of fishing. But imagine that next summer you show up at your favorite spot, only to find that the river is gone. As humans, we often think of rivers as static objects and perhaps even landmarks in our local environments. But in reality, this is far from the truth. Rivers are in fact powerful dynamic systems that wind their way across the landscape as they move from side to side, sometimes even in abandoning their existing channels to forge new paths elsewhere. In many cases, the movement of rivers is slow, perhaps a few centimeters a year, but in extreme cases, rivers can move hundreds of meters or even kilometers in a single season. While a river moving a little bit might not affect your picnic plans next summer, it can be a big deal if you're trying to figure out where to build something important like a bridge or a water treatment plant. The process of rivers moving across the landscape can be devastating, causing roads and even homes to collapse into rivers, potentially endangering the lives of their occupants. By now, I hope you're starting to think, hey, understanding how rivers move is kind of important, eh? The good news is that humans are smart and we have developed sophisticated computer models that we can use to simulate the physical processes of river bank erosion and channel migration. These mod models simulate complicated things like soil cohesion, channel velocities and shear stresses to predict where a river might decide to move to. The bad news is that collecting all the data you need to use these models is really, really expensive. So we typically only use them at sites we're building for building really expensive things like bridges. The other bad news is that at sites where rivers move a lot, these models don't provide very good long-term predictions. That's where the aerial imagery method comes in. With this method, you can simply compare two pictures or surveys of the same river taken on different dates. For example, take the blue line and pink line on my slide that show the location of the channel for Schneider Creek in Waterloo 
1945 and then about 70 years later. By measuring the distance between the old channel and the new channel and dividing that by the number of years, we can calculate an average rate of change. Then we assume that the future movement rate will be the same as the past. People have been using this method for over 100 years because it's quick, easy, inexpensive, and it actually works pretty well. But there are times that using the past to predict the future goes seriously wrong, like if the river suddenly decides to start moving in the opposite direction. That's where my research comes in. We've been working to make these methods better by combining old techniques with new. Using satellite imagery, we can observe the past movements of thousands of rivers all over the world and use this to train artificial intelligence models to help us predict where rivers are going. Our goal is to produce a model that is just as fast and easy to use as the aerial imagery method, but that provides better results and offers valuable statistics like confidence intervals. So the next time you spend time sitting on a riverbank, make sure that you enjoy it, because when you come back, the river might not be in the same spot. And I hope that you'll think of my research on predicting the, the movement of rivers and wonder, where do they come from and where do they go? Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much, Cody. So I'll give our judges a few moments here to, to make their assessments. I'll just bring it to our next speaker. It will be Hugo. So Hugo, if you could put your camera on. Okay, so our next speaker is Hugo Fantucci, and he will be speaking about synergetic valorization of organic and mining waste towards the production of carbon neutral organomineral fertilizer by a catalytic wet oxidation. Go ahead when you're ready. As you may already know, massive amounts of organic waste are generated every day. For example, a typical fruit processing plant generated 30 to 40% of residue to obtain the fruit juice. Yet, just a small fraction is diverted. Similarly, mining operations also generated millions of tons of solid residues, posing various environmental risks. My research explores a solid waste treatment concept called catalytic wet oxidation which can enable the beneficiation of both organic and mining waste synergistically. The goal is to recover any products that benefit the environment and carry commercial value. In this investigation, when I refer to organic waste, it is a specifically wet biomass from wineries called grape pomace, which is currently unexploited by many wineries worldwide. And when I refer to mining waste, it is a specific mineral called kimberlite, common byproduct in diamond mining, accumulated without use in several countries, including Canada. The combined reaction of these two solid wastes conver converts di di disposal costs into an economic opportunity. The novel process generates a high, va high value, active, and stabilized organic mineral fertilizer product. While eliminating toxic compounds. This is done in a single step process within a pressurized reactor without generating any other type of pollution. This novel strategy of waste beneficiation is what I'm most excited about. There are no hazards pollutants left behind. Even carbon dioxide gas is partially captured and stored in kimberlite by a parallel chemical reaction called mineral carbonation. The process does move the industry towards carbon neutrality and circular economy. We still aim to evaluate the ecological footprint of this technology to test the wider application of this process with other food industry byproducts and to determine the commercial value of the end product, particularly as a carbon neutral agricultural soil amendment. The take home message is that waste should never be wasted. 
and, and green chemistry and process intensification are the key to overcome the perceived low value of wastes. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much. So we'll give our, uh, our judges a few moments. Okay. And our next speaker is Aidan England from the Department of Chemistry, and his presentation is called Fashion Forward Production of Plant Based Fabrics. So go ahead when you're ready, Aidan. I remember watching An Inconvenient Truth in my sixth grade science class, and since then, I've tried to limit my plastic consumption and CO2 emission. It wasn't until I started my master's thesis a year ago that I realized I had a disconnect between plastic and clothing. In my eyes, a plastic drinking straw was obviously pollution, but buying a new jacket was okay, even if they were made of the same material. It turns out that fabric can have a huge impact on our environment. <clears throat> Especially at the rate that we throw out and replace our clothes. Why is oil so hard to kick? To a chemist, oil is like a blank building block. Over centuries of trial and error, we've perfected the science of adding linking groups to oil in order to make synthetic fibers. Linking groups are like the hands that allow slick oil molecules to link together and form chains. But what if there was a greener way? What if we could replace oil with plant waste? Plant biomass is a widely available and inexpensive source of sugars, which naturally contain lots of linking groups. By reversing the chemistry of adding linking groups to oil, we could instead remove the excess linking groups from sugars and make fabric from plants. This is the idea of biomass conversion. And biomass conversion has been heavily researched for decades, but one major downfall has stopped it from reaching the industrial scale. It turns out that the heat that's required to remove excess linking groups from sugars is also able to caramelize the sugars in the reaction. If you've ever burnt something in a saucepan, you know how inconvenient this can be. Now, imagine that mess in a chemical reactor the size of a house. This means millions of dollars in downtime for the company and the tough job of cleaning the equipment. My research has the solution to this problem. My work combines inexpensive catalysts and hydrogen gas to remove excess linking groups from sugars and produce fiber precursors. But instead of returning thick brown solids that are challenging to work with, my work returns a clear liquid product. This innovative process reacts the linking groups of sugars with environmentally friendly acetic acid in a process known as acetylation. Acetylation essentially closes the hands of linking groups, stopping the caramelization process while the precursors form. Once the precursors have been made, they're deacetylated, allowing them to link together and form fibers. This technology could make biomass conversion industrially viable for the first time making the fashion industry less dependent on oil and making your closet a whole lot greener. Thank you. Wonderful, thanks so much, Aiden. So we'll give our judges a few minutes. Okay. So our next speaker is Nushin Nikmaram, and uh, her talk will be called From Destroying a Silent Killer to Saving the World. So go ahead when you're ready, Nushin. Thank you. Did you know that cow's milk can contain a contaminant that puts your liver and kidneys at risk? Have you ever seen the pain in someone who is struggling with cancer? What if I tell you that the same contaminant may even result in cancer? This silent killer is named aflatoxin M1 and it's present in milk. Let me tell you a story about how you may end up consuming it on a daily basis. As you can see in the diagram, I have a beautiful happy cow and all she wants is to produce you a healthy and safe milk. But 
everything starts when her core feed is contaminated with a fungi that produces a toxin named aflatoxin B1. When Mrs. Cow ingests aflatoxin B1, it will be converted into aflatoxin M1 in her digestive system and secreted in her milk. The toxin is stable during pasteurization, processing, and storage. So, what can I do to make her milk safer? Because Mrs. Cow definitely is unhappy about her milk. Well, food scientists have been constantly working on offering new processing methods, but they all have the same issues, such as changing the taste or nutrients of milk or not being cost effective when industrializing. My thesis introduces a promising way to overcome such issue. I'm utilizing a game changing technology named high voltage cold plasma that can save the world. Let's see what exactly is plasma. Imagine you put energy into gas system, then the atoms will be separated into ions and electrons. So you produce plasma. So plasma is partially or fully ionized gas. How do I produce plasma in our lab? As you can see in the picture at the bottom left, I apply high voltage, usually 80 kilovolt, to the air inside the package of the produced milk using two electrodes. The created ions such as ozone, hydrogen peroxide, and nitrogen containing species will change the chemical structure of aflatoxin M1 by breaking its double bonds to make it less or non-toxic. The technology is very low cost and time efficient and doesn't change the taste or nutrients of the milk. By treating milk with the high voltage cold plasma, we can open a new horizon for both customer and industry. Thus, I can assure Mrs. Cow that she's producing a healthy, safe milk for you, and she would be very happy to contribute to the Save the World. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Nushin. So we'll just take a pause for our judges to make their assessments. Adam, if I could get you to turn your camera on, it'd be perfect. So our next presenter is Adam Riddell, and his presentation is called Towards the Synthesis of Polysulfurous Compounds Found in Shiitake Mushrooms. So go ahead. All right. Have you ever walked into a restaurant or had somebody cook for you and just thought what they were cooking smelled so good? Well, I can guarantee to you that what they were cooking with involved a plant from the genus Allium, such as garlic or onions, or a fungus from the family Trichalomatosae, such as a shiitake mushroom. Now, on the surface, these species don't have a lot in common, but beneath the surface, they have at least two things in common. The first is that their primary aroma-producing compounds are polysulfurous molecules, and the other is that all of these poly, uh, polysulfurous compounds are made by a very similar process. This process begins with a gamma-glutamyl cysteine sulfoxide, which upon heating or crushing the molecule undergoes an enzymatic conversion, converting it to the corresponding sulfenic acid. This sulfenic acid then self-condenses to form the corresponding thiosulfonate molecule. For many of these species, this is the end of the process, as the thiosulfonate is the primary aroma-producing compound, such as the garlic-derived allicin molecule. However, this is not the case for a shiitake mushroom. For a shiitake mushroom, the process begins with the gamma-glutamyl cysteine sulfoxide known as lentinic acid, which undergoes the same enzymatic process in order to produce the corresponding thiosulfonate. This thiosulfonate then undergoes some process in order to convert it to lanthionine. There are two interesting things about this process, however. The first of all, 
For those of you who don't know much sulfur chemistry, a sulfoxide is a chiral center, meaning that there are eight possible isomers of lentinic acid about the sulfur carbon backbone. Of these eight isomers, it is likely that only one has the correct configuration in order to undergo the specific enzymatic conversion for the enzymes found in the mushroom. The other interesting thing about this process is that the mechanism by which the thiosulfonate molecule is converted into lenthionine is completely unknown aside from its non-enzymatic uh, nature. So my goal for my research is to synthesize all eight possible isomers of lentinic acid using both sulfenate and sulfonate chemistry in order to determine which, uh, which isomer of lentinic acid is naturally occurring as this is currently unknown to science. Once I have done this, I will use it to synthesize the corresponding thiosulfonate and from there track the progression between the thiosulfonate molecule and lenthionine in order to gain possible insight on the mechanism. I also think that this is a worthwhile project for someone like me because I hate the taste of mushrooms, uh, mostly due to the incorrect mouthfeel, but this would be a way of producing an artificial flavorant in order for me to enjoy it as well. Thank you for listening and I hope you have a good day. Wonderful, thanks very much, Adam. We'll just pause for a few moments. Okay, so our next presenter is Mehdi Esmaili from the Department of Chemistry, and his presentation is called Toward, Pe Toward Peptides Improve Life. <clears throat> okay, so go ahead. Okay. Have you ever thought about the side effects of your medicines or the nutrition facts of your food? I always do. You may not think the majority of the inconvenient ingredient in your medications or your food uh, are from their additives, but it's true. Salt and sugar are the two legal poisons that are added to nearly all types of foods as preservatives. But what if we could replace them with some reliable, healthier materials? What if we could use the type of molecules that are essential for our body? My research project is uh, um, focused on, the, on a candidate that not only can preserve our food, but also are recommended for our daily diet. The nominee is a dipeptide, the building block of proteins. Dipeptides have a very special flat sheet motif that, uh, with some very uh, unique location that can act like hook. We can use those hooks to attach our desired molecules. The, the attached molecules would behave differently than uh, when they are not hooked. We've discovered that some of these hooked molecules can be cooked by using UV light, while some others can be protected against the light. We've achieved three phenomenal results that are all related to the orientation of those molecules. First, as shown on the top left corner of my slide, if molecules stand in a, top, in a parallel mode, in that way, we can expect some new exclusive product. Those paradoxes are not formed by using traditional method. This is incredible. By using dipeptide, we have changed the chemical reactivity. Um, you know, this kind of products that we are making is even um, is more fascinating if you know these type of reactions are based on green chemistry principles, which means they, need, they don't need any solvent or any precious catalyst along the way because dipeptide does the, this role. And uh, if you think about protecting the environment, this type of um, reactions are all preferable. The second result is about the productivity of our reactions, uh, that uh, these type of reactions make 100% product without any waste or any side effect. Uh, as shown on the second line, when molecules stand in, a, in an unparalleled mode, in that way, it turns out that uh, the 
help dipeptide uh, increase the life cycle of molecule and or preserve those molecules. So we no longer need to put our nutrition in the fridge or to protect our drugs in the dark bottles. You know, we are all here to make a difference, to improve life, right? I believe by using dipeptide, we have a promising pathway for our future. And if you think about protecting the environment, our nutrition or medication, with the use of peptide, we truly have the peace of mind. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Mehdi. Thank you. We'll take a small break while our judges uh, make their assessments. Okay, so our next presenter is Nicholas Bellinger from the School of Engineering, and his presentation is called Image Registration for 3D Ultrasound Images of Neonates with IVH. Thank you. In cases where infants are born preterm with a very low birth weight, classified by weighing less than 1,500 grams at birth, they have a 20 to 25% chance of developing intraventricular hemorrhaging, IVH, over the following months. Of those that develop a severe case of IVH, they have a 33 to 50% chance of developing post-hemorrhagic ventricular di dilation, PHVD. The infants who develop PHVD are at a high risk for needing invasive surgery to install a shunt in the brain or developing other neurological problems later in life, including cerebral palsy, epilepsy, cognitive impairment, and behavioral problems. These severe consequences later in life for infants with PHVD make early diagnosis and treatment of IVH imperative. The current method to treat PHVD is to drain cerebrospinal fluid from the ventricle. The change in volume of the ventricle is used to determine the optimal time to drain the fluid. Currently, ultrasound is the best method to track the progression of PHVD due to how quick, inexpensive, and non-harmful this imaging method is. 2D ultrasound is in clinical use, but 3D ultrasound has shown promise to aid physicians in making an accurate diagnosis. Looking at the two images behind me, we can see why. Our 2D ultrasound image allows us to see a part of the ventricle, but the 3D mesh in red gives a lot more information on what's actually going on. 3D ultrasound is still a very new uh, imaging modality and is in the research phase. A solid footing is required to be used on the clinical side, especially to ensure that images taken at different times can be properly compared. This is where image registration comes into play. Continuing to look at the two images behind me, if we were to try to register these images so they can be compared, there's a few issues that are gonna to spring to mind. First, the orientations of the ventricles are off. The image on the right is counterclockwise compared to our image on the left. Second, the ventricles are different sizes. The general shape is different as well. Some of this will be due to growth, some of it the IVH or PHVD, but some might also be due to differences of how the images were taken, different settings or warping from an error by the operator. This growth and warping makes registration much more difficult and is classified as non-rigid registration. These factors need to be considered and properly weighted so that we can register the images and isolate the volumetric ventricle changes due to IVH. Currently, non-rigid image registration is a time-consuming process. It requires manual input from a qualified technician and computationally expensive algorithms. By using 3D ultrasound images and meshes of the ventricles as inputs, we can train a neural network to recognize common points between the images and use these as landmarks for registration, cutting out the need for manual input. Furthermore, we can include these landmarks to train another neural network to perform non-rigid registration between 3D images of a patient to quickly and accurately quantify changes in the ventricles of at-risk infants. These neural networks will reduce the load on physicians in diagnosing and treating IVH and PHVD and improve patient outcomes. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nicholas. Thank you. We'll just pause for our judges.
Okay, and our next presenter is Zachary Zentmarie. Automatic deep learning based segmentation of neonatal cerebral ventricles from 3D ultrasound images. So go ahead, Zachary. Hello, everyone. Um, intraventricular hemorrhaging or IVH affects 20 to 25 percent of very low birth weight infants. These infants are also named neonates. This kind of hemorrhaging can also be described as bleeding in the ventricles. And the ventricles are the area in the brain that produce cerebral spinal fluid, and they can be seen in the top left image in green. IVH can cause serious developmental delays in neonates and can possibly be life threatening. So monitoring the progression of IVH is critical because it, it can provide physicians with more resources and information for choosing the best treatment to further prevent brain damage. So currently our group is using 3D ultrasound to observe the ventricles since 3D ultrasound is safer than MRI and more accurate compared to 2D ultrasound. So the purpose of our research is to provide a fast, safe, reliable and automated method of measuring these neonatal ventricles using 3D ultrasound. We are doing this using deep learning segmentation methods. So segmentation is simply pixel wise classification of an image which means that we look at each pixel in an image and determine whether that pixel is part of the ventricle or not. And you do this same process for all the pixels in the image. So our research is to automate this segmentation process because it is time consuming for a physician to manually segment each image, which is currently what is being done right now. And each physician also segments very differently. So we're trying to keep it reliable and repeatable. So our current deep learning method uses special machine learning models, including uh, architectures like UNETs and autoencoders. And what these do is they're able to self-learn and locate ventricles in the image on their own. So our results so far show slight accuracy improvements over current non-deep learning methods and are much faster. So currently non-deep learning methods out there in the published world take almost an hour to segment one image, but our method takes approximately a couple seconds for one image. So we can actually have our model used in real time as the neonate is being scanned. This can make this can help physicians make faster decisions and for problems like IVH, time is of the essence and every minute saved can improve patient health and save lives. Thank you everyone. Wonderful, thanks very much Zachary. We'll just give it a quick pause here. And our next speaker is Devin Heimers from the Department of Physics, and his presentation is called Safer Cancer Treatment with Filtered Interaction Vertex Imaging. Cancer sucks. Each of you, I'm sure, has been affected in some way by cancer. Half of you will have your own battle with cancer. Cancer is what kills the most Canadians. We can all benefit from anything that makes treatment safer and more effective. One rapidly growing treatment method is heavy ion therapy. Unlike traditional X-ray radiation therapy, shown in blue in the upper left, heavy ion therapy in red uses a beam of atomic nuclei. This plot shows the relative radiation dose on the vertical 
delivered at each depth in the patient on the horizontal. You can see that heavy ion therapy is extremely precise, delivering very little dose on the way to the tumor, but maximum dose right at the target depth. Then it stops. There isn't a beam left to keep going out of the patient, so organs behind the tumor get even less dose than those in front. Obviously, this is great for treating tumors in sensitive parts of the body, such as the brain, or for treating cancer in children, where lifetime risk of recurrence is much higher. But heavy ion therapy needs to be aimed a lot more precisely than traditional treatments. Otherwise, its benefits vanish. And that's where my work comes in. I've developed and tested Filtered Interaction Vertex Imaging, or FIVI, which monitors beam position using methods from nuclear physics, a field which is all about measuring interactions between ion beams and targets. On the lower left, you can see how FIVI works. By placing detectors around a patient during therapy, we can monitor them in real time. As the beam passes through the patient, it interacts and produces protons, which we can measure from outside. FIVI identifies the most useful protons and tracks them back to where they were produced. Looking at how the number of produced protons changes with depth, we can predict with very high precision the depth difference between any two treatments. In March, we completed the first experimental test of FIVI using small plastic targets. Our results are on the right, with true depth difference on the horizontal and our reconstructed difference on the vertical. As you can see, there's very tight grouping around the red line, a one-to-one -one relationship between our measurement and actual beam positioning. We can consistently determine the difference between two mock treatments within just two tenths of a millimeter, better than any previous method. Although there's still work to be done in scaling FIVI to work with the higher energies and dose rates used clinically, I just want you to imagine the impact. A patient comes in for treatment. She's lucky the tumor was caught early and it's still small. With FIVI, we can be confident of hitting it. Her first treatment takes only a few minutes. She's in and out. When she comes back the next week, she's lost some weight. Right as her treatment starts, FIVI gives immediate feedback to her doctor. Move the beam back just half a millimeter. With FIVI, each of her treatments is delivered consistently and exactly as prescribed, giving her the best chance of beating cancer. Wonderful, thank you very much, Devin. We'll just pause a moment. Uh, Hi, we can hear you. We'll just okay, give them fine, judges fine. a few more seconds here. Okay, so our next presenter is Surinjoy Singh Singham from the School of Engineering and his talk is called Biodegradable Antimicrobial Non-Woven Filter for Respirator Mask. So go ahead when you're ready. Yes, I love wildlife photography, but one hobby that I have developed during this pandemic is to take photos of the mask that I see on the ground. Have you ever thought about the fate of this mask and where they're going to end up? Pretty concerning, right? The currently available face masks are generally developed from polypropylene and polystyrene polymers. These materials could take up to 500 years to decompose in the natural environment. At the same time, these masks have problems like low breathability, low filtration efficiency for particles smaller than 0.3 microns. And most importantly, they do not inactivate the pathogenic microbes accumulated on the face on the face mask or filters. So how can we reduce the environmental impact and the functional shortcomings of this mask? My PhD research addresses these challenges. To solve this, 
I am developing a biodegradable respirator mask with a non-woven filter that has antimicrobial and biodegradable properties. This mask has two major components, an active and a passive component. The passive component is the supporting body of the mask developed entirely from cellulose fiber extracted from plant biomasses such as miscanthus and switchgrass, which are plentiful in Canada. While the active component is the non-woven filter functionalized with silver infused lignin nanoparticles, as you can see on the top of the figure. The filter is developed through electro spinning technology using green polymers such as polyelectric acid and ethyl cellulose. It has higher breathability and filtration efficiency due to its smaller pore size and larger surface area. Scientific studies have shown that silver nanoparticles can inactivate pathogenic respiratory microbes such as coronavirus. But to prevent the contamination of silver nanoparticles in the environment, we embed silver ions into the lignin nanoparticles. Lignin is a plant-based polymer which has both antimicrobial and biodegradable properties, thanks to lignin. So, the synergistic antimicrobial actions of both silver ions and lignin nanoparticles can inactivate the microbial load from the mass. At the same time, the lignin envelops a release of silver nanoparticles into the environment to prevent the contamination. With that, we have an eco-friendly and a safer mass. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thanks very much. Thank you. So we'll just take a pause for our judges. Okay, and our next presenter is Aparadita Sudarasan, and her presentation is called High Voltage Cold Plasma, the Panacea. So whenever you're ready. Ever wondered how different our foods would have been if not for nonstick cookware? Or how inconvenient travel would have been if not for rain and snow jackets? Do you know what these have in common? Around 50 years ago, we humans came up with fluorocarbons, commonly called perfluorinated compounds, and their counterparts for many applications, such as refrigerants, lubricants, oil, and water repellents. One common example that all of us know is a Teflon coating on our cookware. Some other common yet unnoticed ones are the labels on our plastic containers that say PFOA, PFOS free. These chemicals have lots and lots of fluorine in them that bind with carbon atoms, making them irreplaceable in our everyday lives. But here's a plot twist. All is not well with them. Several studies have shown that they cause a lot of health issues in humans, such as liver toxicity, thyroid tumors, increased blood cholesterol, impaired brain development in babies, compromised immunity, and several forms of cancer. They're also toxic to terrestrial and aquatic animals, accumulate within the bodies over years to alleviate these effects. Their production has since been banned. But here's the catch. We have used them so much already that they are now present around us everywhere, right from the water we drink, to the food we eat, to the things we touch, only making matters worse. They have contaminated our water bodies to such alarming levels that our water filters stand no chance against them. Other technologies like activated carbon have had no effect in eliminating these chemicals either. 
my research here is focused on destroying these compounds from our water sources in a sustainable yet cost effective way. Wonder how? Imagine if you were a Jedi from Star Wars and you had your own lightsaber to destroy all evil around you. Now, what if I give you an actual lightsaber, except that the plasma coming out is not hot and you only need two electrodes and a plug point? That's our high voltage core plasma, which is nothing but a reactive gas produced when you pass air or any gas of your choice between two electrodes with a high voltage difference. You know, something like creating your own lightning within a box. This reactive gas has so many different types of gas molecules and free radicals that can destroy almost any of these water contaminants like pesticides, antibiotics, toxins, viruses, and bacteria. One of the key advantages of using this novel technique is that you generate no residue and you consume very less power. A one-stop sustainable solution. Coal plasma has shown potential to cleave these high energy carbon fluorine bonds and completely degrade these perfluorinated compounds in water, thus ensuring water safety as well as environmental well-being. A promise for a better future. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much. So we'll take a small pause here for our judges. Okay, so our next presenter is Valerie Bauman, and her uh, talk is called Artificial Intelligence for the Bettering of Human Health. Whenever you're ready, Valerie. What's the first thing that pops into your head when you hear the words artificial intelligence? Maybe you think of self-driving cars or robots taking over the world, but today I'm going to challenge you to open your mind to how humans and machines can work together to improve our quality of health. More specifically, how artificial intelligence can assist in the recovery of stroke patients. A stroke is a loss of brain function caused by a blood vessel either bursting or being blocked, and it can leave the person with lasting complications that impact their quality of life. One of these complications is weakness on one side of the body, and it can result in the person being unable to walk without assistance. We can all understand how frustrating it would be to lose this independence of being able to walk on your own. Physical therapy is one approach these particular stroke patients can take to relearn how to walk. This approach involves a trained individual guiding the person's leg as they walk to instill good walking patterns in the patient. A more recent technique is the use of powered lower limb exoskeletons, like the one shown on the right, that actively apply forces to the leg as the person moves. So the idea is that the person wears an exoskeleton and the exoskeleton provides forces to the person's leg while they're walking, just like a physical therapist would. In order for an exoskeleton to provide adequate support, it has to know what motion the user is doing at any given time. Why does the exoskeleton need to know this? Well, think about how your legs move when you're walking upstairs compared to when you're walking on flat ground. When you walk upstairs, your knees bend more to make sure you clear the step ahead of you. Because your legs move differently depending on what motion you're doing, your exoskeleton needs to know what you're doing so it can provide appropriate support. My research involves using artificial intelligence to detect what motion as well as what phase of the motion the user is in for walking, going upstairs, and going downstairs. So, for example, not only does my algorithm know that the user is walking, but also that the user's leg is in the air during walking. Inputs to the algorithm are sensor readings from two sensors placed on the leg as seen in the picture on the left. These sensors measure speeds and accelerations of the segment they're attached to. To teach my algorithm to recognize these motions and their phases, I am recruiting 100 volunteers to walk, go upstairs, and go downstairs while wearing these sensors, as well as additional pressure pads beneath the foot. Just like how a person studies for a test by doing practice problems and checking their answers, the practice problems for my algorithm are the information coming from the sensors on the legs, and the answers are the information coming from the pads beneath the feet. 
Once the algorithm is ready to be used in an exoskeleton, only the sensors on the legs will be integrated into the exoskeleton and used as inputs to the algorithm. My algorithm's ability to detect different motions will allow for better exoskeleton control for those relearning how to walk. So while there may be mixed feelings about how artificial intelligence has been integrated into our lives, I hope hearing about my research today gives you an idea of how humans and machines can work together to improve life. Thanks very much, Valerie. So we'll just take a pause here for our judges. Okay, and our final presenter for today is Michael Lisicki um, from the School of Engineering, and his talk is called Evaluating Curriculum Learning Strategies in Neural Combin Combinatorial Optimization. So go ahead when you're ready. Good morning, everyone. Neural Combinatorial Optimization, NCO in short, is a subfield of deep learning which focuses on designing neural network architectures capable of solving combinatorial problems. One of the most popular combinatorial problem used in the studies is the traveling salesman problem. Its objective is to find the shortest path through a set of nodes, visiting each node exactly once and coming back to the origin. Current approach to NCO is to use attention-based models originally developed for machine translation. Those models perform well, but a large performance gap still exists between them and the classic deterministic solvers. One of the issues is that the researchers have, have mostly focused on training models on individual problem sizes, and the ability of a model to perform well across a large range of sizes has been mostly overlooked. The naive way of improving on that uh, is to sample the problem sizes uniformly during training. In our experiments, we show, however, that you can design a much better sampling strategy by instead ordering the problem sizes by their difficulty level or ordering the problems by their difficulty level. An approach known as curriculum learning. We propose using curriculum learning to facilitate training of a neural network to achieve competitive performance across a range of problem sizes simultaneously. We test several sampling strategies and show that the adaptive staircase, a curriculum learning method recently adapted to machine learning from psychophysics, performs best. In all the experiments, we use the same attention model developed by Wouter Kuhl from the University of Amsterdam. We use the optimality gap as the performance metric, and the optimality gap is the discrepancy between a solution provided by the network and a lower bound on that solution. So essentially, on all figures you see on the slide, the lower means better. We started by training about 150 models on individual problem sizes and tested each of them on a range of problem sizes from 10 to 300. On the top left figure, we can see the resulting performances. Similar performances on the neighboring tasks suggest that the knowledge transfer occurs between the models. This knowledge transfer increases in range but decreases in magnitude as we progress towards larger problem sizes. We also observe a rightward shift of the transfer and all of those confirm that we need a solution that is able to carefully balance large and smaller problem sizes in a non-trivial way. In the second experiment, represented by two figures at the bottom, we train the model using several sampling strategies and compare them to solutions provided by an exact solver called Concord. We did three runs on individual problem sizes, 20, 50, and 100. We ran a naive uniform sampling strategy to show that random problem selection is ineffective. And in the end, we show two curriculum learning strategies. Classic one, which monotonically increased the difficulty level, and the adaptive staircase, the psychologically inspired approach. 
the rehearsal mechanism and improved uh, problem difficulty assessment in the adaptive staircase provide for the best cumulative performance across all the included problem sizes. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Michael. So as our judges are finishing up, that concludes our uh, presentation portion of the day. Um, so for now, uh, we'll take a, a break up until the panel, which will start at 1045. Um, so if I could ask the presenters to please make sure their microphones are on mute for the duration of the break, that would be wonderful. And we'll all meet back here for a panel discussion um, entitled Earth, Air, Fire and Water Elements of a Sustainable Future. So I'll see you at 1045 and please don't forget to vote for the People's Choice Award. Um, you can cast your votes now up until the end of the break and all of the award winners will be announced at the end of the day. So I'll see you all very shortly. Welcome back, everyone. Hopefully you enjoyed the uh, the three minute thesis. So we had some amazing presentations that varied from AI to plasma, talking about human health, protecting human health, protecting environmental health, um, and uh, absolutely well done for all the present uh, presentations that were done this morning. We're now going to move into sort of our panel discussion. And in this panel discussion, it's entitled Earth, Air, Fire and Water Elements of a Sustainable Future. And as many of you know, Earth Day this year turned 50 and it was completely overshadowed by the COVID-19 pandemic. It completely went live uh, or sorry, went into a virtual uh, format rather than people going out and cleaning parks um, as a community. Uh, it all was forced to go more to the household and trying to do uh, initiatives on your own. So the idea today is in part of this panel discussion is to figure out what we can do as physical scientists and engineers in driving our society towards this idea of improved sustainability. And, and we're going to hear from our panelists and I'll introduce them in a second. Uh, they are we're going to be looking at this discussion of sustainability in terms of decline in the environment uh, and this could be eroding soils, it could be air pollution, it could be the, the forest fires that we're seeing out west this fall, uh, the increase in hurricanes that we've seen down in the Caribbean. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things that we can talk about. But really the aim today is to open up a dialogue around the ways that these issues uh, should be considered individually and collectively and how we can sort of integrate our knowledge and move things towards that sustainable future. So that's sort of the goal of what this dialogue, this panel discussion is going to be. How it's going to work, um, I'm going to give some introductions to our four panelists. Uh, they are four very esteemed professionals in their rightful fields, <clears throat> and we are lucky to have them with us today. Uh, and after that, we're going to go through a bunch of questions and uh, there'll be a generic question at first I'm going to ask and then we're going to ask some uh, one word answers from our panelists. This is going to be an opportunity for you as the audience to send in uh, sort of the words that you want to hear our panelists sort of describe more in detail what they're meaning by that one word answer. So it'll be rapid fire. Uh, it should be interesting. I'm hoping that uh, uh, we'll get some good results on that one. And then afterwards, we're going to talk about what uh, grad students can really do to help move the sustainable future forward. At the end, we're going to have Louisa Smith uh, come on. She is the, the brand new career advisor for the College of Engineering and Physical Scientists. And if I'm not mistaken, she probably started right when COVID started. Uh, so she's probably not been on campus that much in, in her duration as uh, at the University of Guelph. Uh, if you do have questions as the audience, uh, please send them in through the chat. Uh, we have somebody monitoring the chat and we'll get those questions uh, uh, to me as the moderator and I will try and ask them as we go along. So with that in mind, let me do some introductions and maybe I'll get uh, Carrie Ann, who is the, the, the maestro behind the scenes here running it for me. If she can maybe get the uh, live photos of the, uh, the various uh, panelists as I introduce them. First up representing Earth, we have Professor Emily Chiang. Emily is with the School of Engineering and give a big wave there, Emily, hi. <laughs> uh, and her research is focused on mineral carbon sequestration in soils, 
uh, conversion of industrially inorganic residues into valuable products, remediation of heavily uh, heavy metal contaminated ecosystems, and finding greener sources of materials and energy. So again, she is representing Earth. Next up, representing air, we have Professor Lian Chen from the Department of Chemistry. And I'm not sure, is her photo up or video live? It's coming? Excellent. Uh, uh, so Professor Chen joined the university in 2017, so she's a fairly new uh, recruit. She is focusing on using renewably generated electricity to drive chemical processes for energy storage, helping us to uh, get weaned from our fossil fuel addiction and reduce our carbon footprint. Next up, representing fire, uh, we have Kuram Nadim. And again, he is fairly new. He joined Math and Stats in 2019. So welcome, uh, uh, Kuram. His Research is focusing on predictive modeling of ecological and environmental processes via big data analytics, and has got a special focus on um, wildland fires. So I'm very interested to hear what he has to say about what's happening out in the on the west coast of North America this uh, this fall. And last, representing water, we have an alumni, Eric Monteith. He is a senior vice president at Stantec Consulting, and he has over 22 years of experience in the design management, uh, planning, piloting, optimization, and commissioning of water treatment and distribution systems. So he's been in the field since he graduated from his undergrad, mostly out in the uh, in the Alberta area. And that wraps up our, our set of panelists. Now, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Bill Van Heist, and I'm the Associate Dean for External Relations within the College of Engineering and Physical Sciences and I'm a full faculty member in the School of Engineering. I have spent probably over 30 years of my career, that's both grad school and my uh, employment, working on air quality. And it's been an interesting ride. Uh, and, and the reason why I say that, when I first started out, climate change was almost like a, a faith. You had to believe in climate change. There wasn't enough evidence to, um, to really support what, what, what people were predicting. And I think now in Canada, especially in Canada with our Arctic behaving the way it is now, uh, the melting of the permafrost, the uh, the ice disappearing at phenomenal rates, glaciers uh, um, just disappearing, I think the evidence is there. We now need to move from the evidence to action, that there's a tipping point there where we have to actually start moving and, and working on it. So I got a couple comments I'd like to make and uh, maybe a call to action to our for our grad students. And the first is, um, and I'm sure you're going to hear this from our panelists, the word sustainability is often overused in our industry and to the point where it's almost meaningless at times and it even worse, it's becoming uh, um, co-opted by the greenwashing of products so that they can then charge a premium price for those projects because they are environmentally sustainable. Um, and that's going to be a problem that we need to overcome. The second one is that the issue of sustain sustainability really is a what we would call a wicked problem. There is no one answer. There are many answers. They are tied together and it is complicated. Uh, and what that means for us is we need to move forward with more of a holistic or a systems approach to solving some of these problems. And oftentimes we can't take uh, one media or one element on its own. We really have to look at the interconnections because what happens in one medium will affect other mediums. And I see that in my own case where uh, pollution from, so air pollution from combustion engines or combustion processes get into the air, but they don't stay in the air. They actually then get deposited uh, through wet deposition, dry deposition onto land surfaces and water surfaces. So there is this whole connect conductivity between our mediums, and that's why it really does become a wicked problem. So I think what our college has, uh, so we have an advantage here in our college. We've got uh, chemists, we've got physicists, we've got mathematicians, statisticians, we've got computer scientists, and we've got engineers. We've got the makings of interdisciplinary teams that can actually tackle these problems and do it well. So my call to action then to these grad students who are listening in on the panel discussion is as you are, you know, processing what their panelists are saying, think about if we can redefine or define a new way of looking at 
our sustainable future so that every one of us can actually work towards that goal and hopefully achieve it within our lifetime. So having said that, why don't we uh, start getting into uh, the, the first question? And, and this is going to be uh, kind of an interesting one. It is under the uh, general topic of sustainability within, within an engineering and a physical science context. I'm going to turn it first to Emily. And Emily, the question I have for you is, how would you define sustainability within the context of your representative element, so Earth in this case, and as it pertains to your research? Hi, everyone. Thanks, Bill, for the question. Um, so um, I think um, I think you know Bill um, uh, said very well um, with regard to sustainability. Um, to me, I think sustain the sustainability means multidisciplinary approach. Because um, I think you know um, you know one thing was the in research environment that we are facing now. It's it's quite different than what uh, what we have like say 20, 30 years ago, where you know everyone sort of all all the scholar kind of work on their own problem you know at hand and you know they apply their own knowledge in, in, in their very specific field. Um, but I think you know the the environmental problem that we're facing now, it's it's big, they're they're multifaceted and they're very complex. So you know knowledge from one area or one uh, discipline is not sufficient enough to you know solve the problem that we have uh, that we have at, at hands. Um, it requires knowledge from many different uh, disciplines and as, as well as you know I think on top of that like it's it's a true integration so you know even that you know we work in the in the project and someone you know you hold, uh, uh, someone is responsible for this aspect the other one is for this aspect it, it doesn't work you know we, we need to work as a true collaboration a true integration of all the knowledge that we have you know in order to have a solution or resolution to you know to to these environmental problems that we have um, and also like you know when I look at my you know research group Group. I have research researchers from many different uh, background: chemistry, bioscience, environmental, mechanical, and engineering. So, I, I think you know sustainability to to me is is you know a true integration of uh, multidisciplinary knowledge. Thank you, Emily. And I'm going to ask maybe if any of the other panelists, uh, uh, so Eric and Leanne or Kuram, if you have any additional insight uh, from your sort of element on what sustainability might mean for for you, go ahead and go go live. Unmute yourself if you want to uh, want to answer that. Okay, so um, I guess I can jump in if I'm live. Oh. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Good. So yeah, so I think I would definitely echo uh, what uh, Emily has said um, and and these problems are really wicked, especially integration of uh, I would say methods and resources and and data and technology and and definitely uh, the challenges that we are facing um, in integration is definitely is the key to um to, to solving these problems and i think that's also relate to the forest violent fire problem and uh i think before i just define sustainability there really wildland fires are related to our forestry so our forests in earth and we what we want is is to preserve the forest um, and and that's actually a question in itself as to what do we mean by preservations preservation of forests. Uh, you know, we have seen uh, forests being uh, cut, you know, reduced in size over the next over the past century. We have seen species vanishing because forests, not only that they provide, of course, resources to humans, they also are home to a great many uh, diversity of species on Earth. Uh, so um, and with the forest vanishing, due to whatever reasons and wildland fire is one of them uh, our biodiversity is is damaged uh, and of course it's also uh, when forests burn it contributes to uh, the the pollution and the carbon uh, dioxide and other uh, harmful uh, gases emission into the environment so basically it's really uh, um, a problem that's that's aggravating 
um, the climate change. So uh, sustainability in that sense is basically preservation of the forest. Uh, and we don't mean by that that we stop uh, using forest for resources. Uh, there have been, um, I would say, an ana I, I would pose here an analogy uh, in we talk about species uh, extinction. So there is background extinction rate. Similarly, there have been background forest fire or wildland fires that have happened for, um, you know, I would say uh, millions of years. So it's not a new phenomenon. It's that the climate change is uh, making it worse. And, and that's where, uh, going back to that point again, we need to uh, get together, integrate. Uh, we need to, you know, uh, collaborate uh, in multidisciplinary settings. Uh, to to attack that problem. So preservation of forestry is sustainability. All right, thank you, Karam. Now that presents sort of an interesting segue. I think uh, I'm going to ask Eric. Uh, so we've got this preservation concept of sustainability. Mm -hmm. So Eric, you're working out in the industry. How would you define sustainable development uh, from that industrial perspective? <laughs> Sure. Thanks, Bill. Uh, you know, before I jump in that, can I just talk specifically on water there to, to add to the last? Sure. Go right ahead. Because they, they are a little bit separate in terms of how I view them. You know, I think um, similar to what Karam just said there, water sustainability as it pertains directly to water um, is really all about availability and quality, right? Like water is a it's a necessity for life. And the interesting thing around sustainability of water is about source protection right now. And the commodification of water right now is a very interesting trend that we need to keep an eye on. Um, because, you know, in order to sustain a population, you need uh, a certain amount of water available for that population, but there's competing resources. There's the agricultural industry, there's industrial production. And so that balance right now is at a bit of a, an interesting inflection point in my mind where you know we're we're as a society we're trying to determine whether we're going to provide and share water equally to a base amount or whether we're going to commodify water and allow people to buy and sell water uh, depending on you know availability depending on sort of where they they have access to that water whether it's upstream downstream so sustainability specific to water is at a very interesting inflection point in my mind in Canada, because we are seeing areas of can even within Canada where there's water scarcity to support the population. And we have these water licenses that are, you know, 100 years old, 120 years old, and typically it's first in first in time, first in right. So those licenses have right to water, but they might have a competing interest over what the, the intended use is today. So around water, it's very interesting. And even the policy around water right now in Canada is evolving. So it's a, it's a very interesting one specific to water. Um, you know, when we talk about sustainable development, um, it, sustainability is an interesting definition and it's co-opted in a number of different ways within development, within communities, within private industry. Uh, really, you know, it started off with this notion that we have to develop responsibly and the, the definition of responsibly has changed. You know, initially it was fiscal responsibility in industry. So, OK, here's here's what it means to our bottom line. And then they started to layer on uh, environmental responsibility and then they went to social responsibility and it sort of evolved into this triple bottom line assessment where you look at the, the economic, the environmental and the social um, measures or weighting of a certain development or a certain investment. And that was sort of the trend probably through the early 2000s. Uh, in early 2010s, but over the last five years or so, it's it has expanded beyond that. And so what I would say in terms of sustainable development, the, the current trend in industry is looking at how do we get the most out of our investment? So we're talking about resiliency and longevity. We're talking about affordability. So the, the I call it the, the TOTEC, so a combination of the capital cost and the operating costs have started to be layered in there more meaningfully the environmental responsibility around that. So what are the impacts of this? And that's a more of a cradle to grave assessment now in terms of sourcing the materials as well as the disposal and replacement is also being considered in that. 
And then the social responsibility, but not just social responsibility, but also social engineering, changing behaviors to suit what they get, what, what uh, investment they're willing to make, as opposed to trying to cater the investment or the infrastructure to suit the current practices of, the, of your community or of your clients. Um, so it's, it is evolving quite rapidly. And, and you know, I think what would be interesting to, to the grad students here is that this digital uh, evolution within the industry is changing that considerably, changing the calculus around it. This internet of things, augmented reality, uh, machine learning, and, and Bill, you stole a little bit of my thunder talking about the systems approach. You know, it's not, they're, they're not looking at investing in one area solely, but they're using machine learning and the internet of things to figure out how does this affect customer sentiment analytic or customer sentiment. How does this work with it with the other systems that are in place to build a, a a robust and resilient business or community, right? So sustainable development right now is starting to expand rapidly to look at all of the systems that go into a development or into a business and a lot of the non-intuitive parameters that affect each of those subsystems to create a, a more resilient and more robust whole. Cool. Thanks for that, Eric. That, that was really well said. Um, and I'm going to turn the next question over to Karam. And you're a math and, and stats professor, and you know you don't, you don't always link math and stats to sustainability, but you use big data and you focus on wildfire. So can you sort of expand on your role as a statistician and how you are helping with that sustainable or that sustainable future. Hope you're muted. Yeah, so let me first start with the comment on, um, you know, sustainability versus mathematics and statistics. So I think uh, on surface, uh, it's, you know, we might see that, oh, there is no link, but actually there, are, I would say in terms of applications, they are really now fundamentally linked or should be linked. And uh, statisticians, mathematicians, uh, and of course, uh, um, you know, uh, these, these are the subjects, core subjects that provide um, uh, foundations for machine learning and, and artificial intelligence. So, uh, really, uh, uh, statisticians, mathematicians are poised to make a very, very pivotal role uh, in solving these challenging problems by, uh, say, uh, helping integrate uh, um, myriad streams of data sets, as uh, you know, we just heard uh, from Eric that Internet of Things. So there are challenges of actually curating data, um, and and then you have. Uh, uh, applying methods, machine learning and artificial intelligence methods to say, uh, understand the impact of climate change and human anthropogenic activities on Earth systems. And uh, if I talk about specifically about the forest fires or wildland fires, and forests are one of, you know, part of our systems. Uh, and um, uh, there are, uh, for instance, uh, questions like, how would this climate change play out in future in say next 50 years uh, uh, in, with respect to biodiversity in our forest with respect to uh, the rate of wildland fires with respect to area burn and um, uh, you know carbon emissions from the forest because of uh, wildland fires so these are the questions we are uh, mathematicians, statisticians can definitely jump in with their uh, hopefully big, powerful toolkit of machine learning and AI methods and, and basically orient their efforts in this direction. Of course, we have been now leveraging these methods in other disciplines like, you know, um, self-driving cars and maybe we might have self-driving planes and or, you know, all in all sort of walks of life, uh, we are applying AI, but definitely what we need to do is to direct that knowledge in solving uh, the climate change related issues in making our planet uh, greener. Uh, and I would also um, point out in terms of my own research. Um, so just, just uh, 
a uh, couple thoughts here what we have done. So we in Canada we had a uh, in a in a way a vacuum of uh, AI uh, models for predicting um, occurrence of fires, wildland fires, for instance, wildland fires can happen because of lightning strikes or you know human anthropogenic activity. Uh, because we, of course, we love our woods. We we want to go outside, or we are working in the forest, or so there are many, many ways in which humans can be responsible in actually inducing forest fires. So uh, we came up with a framework for predicting uh, fires uh, for both sources throughout Canada for the first time, to the best of my knowledge. So that's that's where we are at and and the next challenge a couple of challenges are um, you know how can we actually predict the severe fires the fires that we are seeing in the in the west for instance uh, you know in uh, of course we had bc fires we had fort mcmurray fire that was one of the biggest uh, you know even in terms of insurance losses uh, we have we can see what's going on in in western usa so um uh, uh, yes, yeah, so that's that's the one point. The other is that uh, with the climate change, we are expecting that the wildland fires would uh, the occurrence and their severity would increase in intensity. So we call it fire currents. So that's the terminology we usually use. So can we predict these fire currents? And there are other questions like would our the climate would that be just hot and dry or like uh, maybe wet and hot. For instance, say the lightning strikes are storms like dry storms. Basically, they pass through the you know over land. Where especially if you have you don't have much rain, but you have a lightning strike. So that's a bad thing. If you have a lot of rain and lightning strike, you're in good shape, right? You know the rain helps. So so these sort of questions are actually with respect to predicting climate itself like at, at fine detail. So so these are the challenges and going back to the question, that's where mathematicians and statisticians can jump in and that's where our students can think about, you know, leveraging their knowledge that they have gained in the college and and, uh, you know, get in, into the field and start working on these problems. Awesome, thank you so much. So I'm going to go next to Leanne, and so we basically we're going from uh, big data, looking at hectares of forest, and now we're going to go to your research, which is computational electrochemistry, and looking at sort of that atomic scale approach. How is that contributing to sustainability? Thank you, Bill. Um, so I guess I'll just start with the previous question about sustainability, sustainability in terms of air. Uh, and I think it's a pretty obvious one because the goal here is to reduce um, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. So, so we know that the Paris Agreement um, has a limit of two degrees Celsius of temperature increase above pre-industrial levels. And ideally, this should be below 1.5 degrees Celsius. To achieve this latter goal, one study has found that we must become carbon neutral by the year 2050, uh, which means that we have, we'll have to directly deal with the CO2 that's already present, uh, either by sequestration, which I know is what Emily works on, and as well as chemical conversion, which is what I work on. Uh, and also another effort is to make an overall shift towards carbon neutral or carbon free energy sources. So in terms of what, what I do then in particular, um, the, the approach is to use renewable electricity to drive the chemical reactions. Um, and this is attractive because we can then produce value added products uh, sustainably as well as under ambient conditions. Um, the problem right now is that many of these electrocatalysts are not very efficient, so that there is a community effort to try and improve the activity among other properties of these catalysts. Um, and But the problem is that electrochemical reactions are very complex um, and it, it involves many different species reacting on the surface of the electrode, uh, in, interacting with each other with the solvent, and all of it is under the effects of an applied potential. Uh, and adding them to the complexity is the inherent difficulty of measuring reaction intermediates. Um, these are, these are, this is difficult in general, but in particular for electrochemistry as well, because these intermediates are short-lived and very dilute compared to their environment. Uh, we have some experimental information from, the, from these reactions. So we, we get product distribution, we get formation rates, um, but for the most part, we don't have information about intermediates and only a very small number uh, is confirmed. Uh, so 
this is why simulations on my part can really help help us uh, make an impact because we can map out the mechanisms that are unknown experimentally uh, using simulations. And then we can start to understand the intrinsic factors that limit the activity of these elect electrocatalysts in order to make them more efficient and more selective um, for the future. Awesome, thank you so much. So we're gonna go to the uh, a rapid fire round where I'm gonna ask you uh, one question. Uh, and I want you to basically give me a one word answer. This is going to be quite challenging and we'll go through all four panelists and we'll start with uh, the element Earth. So my question then to you is uh, describe the key sustainability challenge uh, in terms of Earth and let's go to Emily first. Um, it's it's a very challenging task, as you <laughs> as you said, Bill. Um, I think the challenging um, the I I I would think the word of uh, uh, perspective perspective. So I think can, can I explain or uh, no nope, no nope, I just want one word all right okay okay my word is perspective <laughs> okay yeah for Earth the challenge for sustainability. Um, uh, scaling. Scaling. Kiram? Information. Info. And Eric? I'll go with expectation. All right. And so everybody listening, so if you want, after we're done the, uh, the other three rounds, if you want one of our panelists to expand on what they mean, type it in the chat and then uh, uh, Nick will forward that to me and we'll get the, uh, the panelists to expand. Okay, so let's go on to air. We'll do it in the same order. So Emily, if you wanna give me your one word for air. Um, capture. Capture. Leanne? Activity. Activity? Kieran? I would say prediction. And lastly, Eric? Say glo global. Global. All right, moving on to fire. Uh, Emily? Efficiency. Leanne? Control. Control. Kieran? Suppression. Suppression. And Eric? Oh, I always get to go last, so I should have it very quickly here. Uh, I'm going to go for fire. I will say um, complacency. All right, and the last one is going to be for water. So Emily, fire away. Conservation. Leanne? I have a very similar one, preservation. Preservation, nice. Uh, Kieran? Yeah, I think I would gay. Yeah, I would go with, hmm, have to think because I don't want to use preservation. So. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, uh, for water, I would say consumption. Okay, and then Eric? It was security. All right, so as I said, if you are listening and you want to hear one of our panelists explain their one word answer in more detail, type it into the chat, Nick will get it to me. Um, I wanted to, to maybe to start off, I've got one for Eric. You use complacency for fire, and I'm curious about that one, what, why you feel that is the challenge. Oh, you picked the one I had to hum and haw over too, right? <laughs> uh, so I would say in terms of complacency, it's easier for humans to dissociate themselves from forest fires because they don't, it's not something that they rely on to the same degree. It's, it's sort of something they can, think that is someone else's problem and is probably most easily dissociated from their own situation. And so it's probably very difficult to drive the motivation in the vast majority of people to be proactive 
in addressing it. All right, awesome. All right, I've got one for Emily coming from the audience. Uh, your one word answer for Earth was perspective. If you can maybe get a, expand on that. Right, I think I think that would be my one word for all the areas uh, for in, related to the environment. I think the perspective of people um, towards um, environmental protection is very important. And I think just follow up what Eric has said. Um, a, a, a lot of time um, people dissociate themselves from these environmental problem and this not in my backyard sort of a, um, attitude is what we have seen very often. Um, you know, it's everyone agree that environmental protection is very important and being environmentally friendly is very important, but what what have we done? You know, what can what can can we do? I, I think the perspective needs to be changed that it is not just, you know, somebody's problem. It is my problem and I, I need to solve it. All right, well said. OK, why don't we go on to the next rapid fire round and this time rather than the challenge, we're going to look at what are the opportunities for a sustainable uh, uh, future. And again, we'll go with earth, air, fire and water, but let's mix up the order. Let's go with Eric first. So if you want to come up with a one word answer for uh, opportunity in earth. Compassion. And Jerome will go into the opposite order. <laughs> yeah, I would say uh, opportunity in uh, forest fire research is AI machine learning. OK, Leanne? Storage. Emily? Technology. And then moving on to air. Eric, what do you think is the one word sort of opportunity? Air. Okay. Collaboration. And Kieran? Uh, I would say um, adopting green technologies. Sorry, I'm not using one word, I guess. Yeah. I'll use technology. Kieran? Yeah. All right, Leanne? Uh, Sorry, um, transformation. 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 And Emily? Integration. Okay, integration. Moving on to fire then, let's do uh, Eric again. Understanding. Kieran? Hmm. Literacy. Leanne? Big data. And Emily? Experience. And lastly, we're on to water. So, Eric? Management. And Kira? Uh, responsibility. And Leanne? Humanism. And Emily? Hope. Hope. All right, so audience, as with the uh, last rapid fire round, if you wanted uh, one of the panelists to expand on their words, send it into the chat. Um, the one that kind of got me, uh, and again, I'm going to go to Eric. I don't know why I keep picking on you, Eric. Mm. Under Earth, you said compassion, and I, I'm interested to hear what you say. What's the reason for that choice? Well, I think to me, um, the reason I say compassion is that unless we can uh, treat all like each other with compassion and, and empathy around like on a global scale, that one to me more than any is is global and it's got to be rooted in a respect and a compassion for all the people in the world if we're going to coexist. So that to me, more than any of the others, requires that. All right, my internet is trying to freeze on me. 
Uh, hopefully you can still hear me. And let's go to uh, Leanne. There's a question from the audience on your use of the word storage for Earth. Yeah, so I was just thinking about um, part, one of the strategies I mentioned was um, uh, sequestration or storage. I, I think that there there is an effort um, that Emily knows more about, which, which is uh, trying to uh, store more of the excess uh, CO2 uh, in, in different parts uh, of our of our geography, such as soil or the ocean. Uh, and pro probably Emily can make a better comment, more scientific about the storage part. So, Emily, well, you want to comment? Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Lian. Um, so there is a lot of uh, storage, uh, you know, path pathway that uh, people are talking about when we're looking at carbon sequestration. Um, the, you know, the part that I I, I am looking at. Um, so there are different wedges that are uh, av available right now that people are capturing CO2 through different wedges. And the one that I am working on right now is through uh, mineral carbon sequestration. Um, and that um, that is is I would say a couple years ago it is approach that people has already dismissed um for you know not uh, on a very good you know the uh, fundamental to dismiss it um and i think you know with my research recently that we have uh, uh, proven that you know it is um both on the from the lab scale pilot scale as well as in field scale that you know mineral carbon sequestration is a very good way to store uh, CO2 and it's something that um, everyone um, in, in fact is able to uh, to to con con contribute in, into this uh, effect. Uh, and I also see that uh, there is a, uh, I can explain a little bit about in integration and I think, you know, to echo back what Bill has said in the very beginning, um, you know, the problem that you know, we see in, in atmosphere where the CO2 in increase, CO2 level increase, it's not just because the CO2 level increase, it is all the other activities um, in earth, in water, um, in the fire that results in, in, in that, you know, increase in the, in the CO2 in the air. So integration is the problem is integrated to you know demonstrating the, in the air but I think also integration means that we need to integrate our knowledges and solve the problem so, on both sides. Awesome thank you and it's like you read the uh, the mind of one of our audience members because they were actually asking the next one was for air and integration that, that you put in so good preemptive strike on that one. All right uh, we're going to move on a bit and Let's start talking about making some connections. So in our audience, we have a fair number of grad students within the College of Engineering and Physical Sciences, and we need to pave the road for them forward to make sure that they, they have a path forward in this sustainable future. So uh, maybe I'm going to start with uh, Kuram on this question. And what gaps do you still see that are needed to be bridged between the research topics, the disciplines, and industry to work towards a sustainable future? Um, I think I I would kind of go back to a little bit. Uh, the last uh, word that I used was literacy, I think. Um, and um, we we really have, if we reflect on what we, uh, you know, as, as graduate students, what we learn in the academy, I think we, we definitely learn all the nitty gritty about our subject. So if you are an engineer or if you are a computer scientist or a statistician or mathematician, of course you are learning the tools in that particular discipline. Uh, but I think uh, literacy and again, uh, as Emily said, perspective, it is extremely important. I think really timely uh, need is that we develop a perspective and understanding of the world around us, especially the earth system, the way they are changing. And um, I think that is definitely a, a very important point. And I think uh, maybe that's also something that we kind of, we should also reflect on our curriculum as well as to, to what extent are we providing our students opportunity uh, to, to learn about the changes that are actually happening right now uh, in terms of climate change, in terms of loss of biodiversity, in terms of you know our anthropogenic activities that are that we are unleashing uh, on Earth, and in terms of our uh, even I would say uh, our our social changes and political changes that are happening around us, and I think that's the deeper perspective that would 
induce that energy in individuals to work on these problems, right? So if if and and you know if I, if we are motivated uh, to solve a problem, I am pretty uh, hopeful. One of the word that was used, hope. So I am pretty hopeful that we do have the capacity, we do have the minds, we do have the technology. Everything is there. It's what we need is 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 that hope in our ability to change and and our understanding of what that change is. So uh, sorry, Bill, I think I kind of went too abstract and, and I know that you had those specific bullet points. Probably I missed that, but I think that's what I really got to say about it. So if we have that mindset, I am pretty sure that we, we are going to make uh, changes and we will we will tackle this challenge in future as uh, as as a I would say a species on a, that has has this ability, unfortunately, to create problems and hopefully to solve them as well. All right, I can open that up to the other panelists. So, uh, Leanne, would, is there anything you would like to add on to that? Um, I think that uh, I can I can speak about my field. So uh, for electrocatalysis, um, it, it's common right now for uh, theorists and experimentalists to work together, uh, but um, it, it is not yet standard practice to, to really bring prototypes of working systems to, to reality. So, so that's something that we can work on definitely and sort of keeping in mind what, what goes into uh, such a process. So sort of scaling up, you know, what works in the lab and how do we make that also work for a, a plant, for example, uh, and thinking about um, the different parts of the, the system. When you design an electrolyzer, you have to just, you have to not only focus on the catalyst itself, you have to also make sure that all the components play together. Your electrolyte, your uh, the different electrodes uh, that interact, um, the separation membrane, all of it has to be integrated in a cell. So, so I think that's something that we can work toward instead of just focusing on the, uh, I mean, of course, the science itself is important, focusing on the fundamentals, but also thinking about how we can make that a reality. All right, thank you. And then uh, Eric, any additional comments? Yeah, you know, just to add on that, and, and I will say that I am very far removed from university research at this moment, so uh, it, this might be, uh, um, I'll take it more from an industry perspective, I guess. You know, I think that any greater connection we can make between our research and the actual cultural change and behaviors that we're trying to promote, uh, you know, specifically around sustainability is critical. You know, looking at the upcoming collision course of, you know, population growth, urbanization, uh, financial resource depletion, aging infrastructure, and climate change and this expectation of a standard of living that is potentially unrealistic going forward you know if we can recognize that context to a greater degree and apply that those aspects into the research i think that would be really helpful because you know ultimately what we want to do in terms of sustainability we're trying to drive a, a cultural shift and behavioral shift to to protect the environment right OK, and then Emily. Yeah, I agree with uh, what everyone has said. I think it's very well put. Um, I think, um, you know, a we need to promote like we have. To, I think many times we have the technologies. Um, one thing is, you know, for us re researchers are to promote um, and get wide acceptance of the uh, of the of the technology, because without the large scale applications, um, you know, the effects going to be very little. And also, I think, you know, we need a paradigm shift in, you know, human behaviors um, to, you know, to really solve this problem um, of, uh, you know, climate change um, and all the other problems as well. And all the other problems. <laughs> well, so, um, so we're coming up to our, our question and answering period. So if the audience has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. Uh, Nick will forward them on to me. But in the meantime, while you're doing that, I'm going to ask just sort of a follow up question. And for the panel, what do you think are the actions that the graduate students who are watching can take to help bridge the gaps that have been identified? And maybe let's start with Leanne on this one. 
Um, yeah, so with respect to um, what what I was saying earlier, I think probably becoming familiar with the techno economics of the, of the particular system we're working on is uh, is a good place to start. Um, we, we do some of that in our field, but this is sort of it's not um, uh, a, a major consideration most of the time. So, so I think that if a student were to familiarize themselves with these analyses, um, at the at the start of their um, endeavor projects, that would really help. Uh, it would frame the problem and and really uh, provide a driving force for the project to go to completion. All right, and let's go to Emily next. Uh, well, I think um, I think uh, very important for you know younger um, researchers, um, you know, student graduate students to be um, brave and challenge. Um, I think many times, you know, um, sometimes your supervisor tell you, OK, you do this. No, really? You know, is that uh, the best way of doing things? Um, is that really what the solution that we're looking for? I think one, one thing is that you don't want to spend, you know, you know, a couple years, you know, for PhD will be three, four years on something that you might not agree. So I think the most important thing before you are working on any project um, is you know, investigate and agree, you know, that you you have a true passion, you believe in what you're doing. Um, and if not, challenge, you know, challenge the conventional thoughts, challenge your, uh, challenge your supervisor. All right, well said. Uh, let's go to Eric. Uh, I think it's along the lines of, of what Leanne said there, but, you know, understanding the context, like what is the ultimate end goal of the research, you know, Educate yourself with respect to the real, the, the applicability in the world and where you think it can have the most positive impact and use that to inform the direction of the research and the gaps. Like identify that problem, but be bold in, in understanding what that problem is and where you think you can have an impact and, and sort of drive that societal behavior shift that Emily was talking about in her last answer. You know, and, and then if you can provide that context to it, I think it'll help guide the research and make it more applicable at the end and maybe help scale it to a greater degree. OK, and then last, let's go to Kiram for your perspective. Yes, I would say, uh, you know, uh, I talked about, uh, you know, developing that perspective in 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 the last uh, uh, bit. Uh, so I think the what we, you know, as student, what you really need to take is action. And that is action at all levels and all the time when you have an opportunity. For instance, if you are working on your project, you can reflect on as to how this work can potentially contribute to solving a problem, no matter how small is it. So that's not an issue. It's it's the, the issue here is the attitude and our attitude determines our action. So starting from your graduate research project, you can move with that mindset to any profession that you're taking, be it in industry, be it in, you know, government, or if you you end up maybe you end up being uh, becoming a policymaker, you know, this is really uh, the challenges that are facing is really really society wide, um, and it it basically encompasses all aspects of our life. So I think uh, what we need. Um, I, you know, what as a graduate student, what I would say is, is those, those skills of leadership, of those skills of making a change, is really important. And I think your actions and and your actual work would then follow. If you make a determination that okay, this is a problem and uh, we need to, you know, address it. Let's say you are a statistician, and then you would uh, most likely divert all your energy uh, in that direction. I think that's that's the mindset of change that is needed. And I think as a graduate student, uh, you think about it, instilling that mindset in yourself. Awesome. All right, we do have a couple of questions from the audience. And the first one actually is directed towards Emily. And it is, how can we play a uh, part of capturing CO2? Uh, and do you have a specific examples of this? And I, I'm assuming that maybe it is capturing CO2 in our own personal life and what our choices and things like that, rather than industry capturing CO2. 
Right, right. Yeah, so because, uh, you know, the work that I am working on is on uh, atmospheric uh, CO2 capture. So it is you don't need to have a special setting, you know, to have the uh, CO2 uh, capture. And the work that I have been doing is to using mineral uh, soil amendment, um, you know, that apply to ag agricultural soil, but it can also be, you know, for example, you have a plant. You can put the mineral inside your plant and uh, capture CO2. So that's what I mean by that. Everyone is is able to capture CO2 if you like. Awesome. And the next question is for all panelists, and it's actually quite an interesting uh, question. So what sector, so it could be government, industry or academia, is currently the rate limiting sector when it comes to promoting a more sustainable future? So let's go with Eric first on this one. I'm curious on the industry side, what the view is. So my, my view is quite clearly the government side, um, but I guess the the knock onto that is it's the people like government responds to people and I think that unfortunately you know when it comes to sustainability in the environment because of the 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 unless you're acutely affected by a circumstance related to climate change or sustainability uh it's back of mind gets pushed behind in priority and that goes right through the government policies like the government reacts to what what the people want and are most vocal about and right now you know it's just it's a cumbersome process right there's not there's not enough benefit near-term benefit to changing our behaviors and that's got to be driven for government in my opinion all right thank you and any other panelists want to comment on that one uh, I just wanted to also add, uh, uh, you know, uh, a comment on um, the the industry. So if we look at in industry itself, you know, the in industrial um, parts of the, you know, the the, the production. Um, I, I think, you know, it it uh, it is. Um, I do, I think the rate limiting would be the more uh, crude um, uh, in industrial um, um, companies such as oil mining um, because. Um, they're the one who is responsible for, you know, the 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 larger, uh, you know, emission of uh, of uh, different kind of con 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 contaminant. Um, but also the other thing is that one we we have to remember that um, you know the end the more fine chemical production, you know, they are getting their raw material from these you know crude uh, chemical production company. So it is still a chain. Like you know, yes, you know, you might see the fine uh, chemical or pharmaceutical com companies. They're not producing as much but the raw material that they're getting from has already you know come with all the you know emission you know in, in into it but you know I, I think the 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 rate limiting ones are the uh, you know the the, the crude chemical um, uh, industry where if we can change over there then the impact is large Bill right. Bill can I jump in as as the Albertan on the call sure um, of course Although I'm from Ontario and went to Guelph as well, I don't think you mentioned that in my preamble. And I agree with Emily entirely in terms of you know where we need to tackle the problem. But I think that not enough attention is paid to the downstream end of the pipe and what we as people need to do because you know big industry, small industry, they're capitalists. They're in they're in business to make money. And on the demand side, we need to significantly shift the demand side if we expect the behaviors of the supply side to change. Um, so government does have a hand in that, but so do we. All right, and in light of time, I'm gonna move on to the, the last question we have from the audience. And again, it's for all panelists. And do you have advice for new researchers for how to sell the benefits of sustainability to industry, uh, mainly to invest in sustainable focused research? when it requires immediate investment, but the return on investment may not be realized for many, many years. This is the question every academic faces in terms of sustainability. Anybody want to take, tackle that one? And silence, so there's, there's an answer in and of itself hey, right there. Bill, uh, can, I, can, I, can I put one thing out there that we're looking at? So, sure. so one of the, the trends, at least in consulting right now, is rather than looking at CapEx, the capital cost of doing things, uh, and weighing that against the OpEx, we're trying to convince industries, communities to take more of what's called Totex approach, looking at the net present value, uh, trying to extend that out within industry, it's tough because they'll take a two or three year 
sort of rate of return expectation where in a community you can get 17, 18 year rate of return expectation and, and they'll, they'll consider it a favorable response. So I think we need to change that expectation in terms of, you know, what is a return period that we find acceptable? And then if we can continue to move that goalpost a little bit, and then on the research side, we can articulate it better to see what the other benefits are and create a more holistic value equation rather than just dollars and cents. You know, that's our best tool we have right now. And we're, you know, we're not winning yet, but we're making progress, I think. All right, in light of time, I'm going to sort of cap it there. Uh, I know there was another couple of questions in the chat, so I'm sorry we didn't get to them. But I do want to ask each of the panelists one more question and then we're going to wrap up. And that question is, look back at yourself in your undergrad days or maybe in your uh, master's PhD days. What advice do you wish you had uh, given to you at that point in time that would have helped you in your future uh, endeavors? So let's go with, uh, Kuram first. Yeah, I think uh, looking back at myself was, uh, you know, as I can see all the panelists here can relate, or at least those uh, uh, who, who, were, who were writing a PhD thesis were too engrossed in my own problem. So, <laughs> so I would say uh, I would definitely have taken the opportunity to, to venture into uh, other areas that were at least adjacent to my area, although you know, uh, I am more on the applied side, and I, I had the ability to work on, uh, you know, uh, ecological, quantitative ecology or ecological uh, information. But I, I still kind of, when I reflect back, I still feel that oh, uh, I might have been uh, maybe at least a pars partially a GIS specialist. And now I realize that you know the knowledge of Earth systems and and geographic information systems is really the key to solving Earth problems. So that's actually a technical skill. And uh, so if you identify any such skills along the way, do try to pick up as many as you can. Awesome, Emily, I'll put you under the uh, hot seat next. Um, I, uh, I wish I had more fun. <laughs> <laughs> well said, well said. <laughs> All right, Leanne. Uh, so for, for me, I, I would say that um, if I could talk to my past self, I would say that I, I would I should be getting a big picture view of the field early on. Um, and I, I think that all of us, we, we focus on, on the fundamentals first. Uh, and that's also what I did at the beginning. Um, but but later on, you you definitely need to have a bigger picture view of the of the field. Uh, so so that's something that does come with time and experience, but also you can't start too early. All right, and then let's go with Eric. All right, uh, you know I think Karam actually put this a little better than I would have in my notes, but that adjacencies notion, like don't narrow yourself too early. Take an opportunity where you see an opportunity. If you can identify the value in that opportunity, even though it might not be exactly what you want learn the adjacencies, learn the broad perspective, take that, identify what you want to accomplish from that opportunity. And then when you've maximized that, you got to know when to move along as well. Like, you know, make yourself well-rounded. And the other one was find a champion. If you're in a position where you don't have somebody invested in your development, you don't feel like you are valued, it's time to go and find a different opportunity. You could spend a lot of years in there hoping to get somewhere. If you don't have a champion or somebody that's going to mentor you, it, it, you know, take what you can from that opportunity. Maybe it's a year, maybe it's a year and a half, and then move along. All right, I would like to thank all our panelists for the uh, the words of wisdom you shared with us today. And this is about our sustainable future. And some of the words you gave us in the opportunities were compassion, collaboration, understanding, and hope. And I think that's where uh, the opportunities lie. Now, before we end this, I'm going to pass this over to Louisa Smith. She is our career advisor uh, in the College of Engineering and Physical Sciences. And as I said, she is fairly new to the portfolio. And actually, I think it is a brand new uh, role in our college. So without further ado, I'm gonna get Louisa to say a few more comments. 
Great. Thanks so much, Bill. Um, just wanted to comment on how informative this entire session was for me from the research, from even just the panel, you know, not having a background in, uh, you know, physical sciences myself. It was really interesting to hear all of your different uh, kind of insights about where you think the industry is going and even where the industry currently is. So really, really interesting on my end. So in terms of a bit about me, that's correct, Bill. I did just join the team here about the end of March, so I am still integrating to the team as well. Um, so I've met with several different students and faculty in the past several months, and I've really been enjoying settling in. So for all of you folks who may be, you know, in the midst of their research and kind of their careers um, and kind of wondering what to do next, that's kind of where I come in. So in your research, you have developed a lot of specific strengths that are really unique to you and can really contribute to a successful and also rewarding career. But since you've been really focused on your studies and research, you may not have had the time or the energy or even the mental capacity to start to focus on those strengths and really reflect on those strengths. So regardless of whether you have a very clear idea of your career goals or even if you're not quite sure what to do next, I'd love to meet with you and help you discover and articulate those skills and really market them to employers. So if you're not sure what's next for you, that's where I come in and I'm ready to meet with you and talk with you about different services. So that can include resume feedback, interview coaching and preparation, general conversations about career development, any job search support or career related questions, I'm happy to help you out with that. And you might be wondering, when should I see a career advisor? What would that make sense for me to do? Um, you should meet a career advisor if you're looking to learn a bit more about different career options available to you. If you're looking for support with maybe a current job search or perhaps an upcoming job search, I'm happy to help with that. If you are navigating maybe potential future education options, if you're also wondering if you should continue on in academia, I'm happy to help navigate that. If you're unsure about what to do next, or even if you have a disability and are looking for support related to strategies for workplace success, I'm happy to help you with that as well. So um, in terms of how to access these services, there's a few different ways you can approach this. So the easiest way is to book an appointment with me through Experience Wealth. Now, if you are an alumni, so if you do graduate or when you do graduate rather, uh, and you're looking for services afterwards as well, you have access to services for uh, one year afterwards and beyond that at a small fee as well. And as for some current resources that are available to all of you right now, I would encourage you to explore uh, our website that is Recruit Guelph. Uh, so if you go on there, there is a tab for graduate student resources, and there is a lot of fantastic resources on there to help you explore different career pathways, both inside and outside of academia, uh, different resources to help you prepare for interviews, and just general career advice on there uh, for folks who have graduate degrees. So again, you can access those through Recruit Guelph, and there's a tab for graduate students specifically. So once again, just to wrap up quickly, because I am mindful of time, uh, if you would like to speak with me or if you have any questions, the easiest thing to do is to book an appointment with me through Experience Wealth. Or if you want to just have a general conversation and have some questions through email, if you type into Google SEPS Career Advisor, I'm the first uh, page that comes up. So my contact information is on there. Or of course, you can send me a message through Teams. So thanks so much for having me. It was really fantastic here to hear hear all of your insights, both from the research side and from the panelist side, and I look forward to supporting you folks. Thanks so much. Thanks, Louisa. And with that, what I'm going to do is first off, thank all the, the panelists once again. Uh, it was a fantastic dialogue, and I really enjoyed the, uh, the exchanges that we've had. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Leonid Brown to give sort of the concluding remarks for the Graduate Research Day. So Leonid, take it away. Thank you, Bill. And I will start with thanking all our participants once again. I think it was a fantastic graduate research day. First, we had 15 very interesting presentations from our students. These were really interesting and uh, 
uh, I learned a lot of new stuff personally, and um, I'm going to talk about the presentations a bit more later. Uh, next, we had a fantastic panel. Again, a lot to learn uh, to expand your horizons. I, I want to second the advice to see the big picture because we all, especially when we are young, we are so engrossed in our own research and we don't see where it can be applied and how it can interface. And importantly, we don't always see how to learn from what other people do in something which may seem unrelated to you when you're just starting your career. So as well, looking back at my own career, I, I regret that I didn't take big picture early on, And but this is something you learn hard later on, even when you're a young professor, it applies. Uh, in any case, the panel was fantastic, so I want to thank all the panelists, I want to thank all the presenters once again, and all the spectators, and um, great number of questions, very really interesting questions. So I, I declare both student presentation and panel a big success. I hope everyone agrees with me. And with uh, that, we are going back to presentations and going to talk about the winners. So I should say you guys and girls gave us a really hard task. Because there were so many good presentations, it was very crowded at the top. So the judges spend uh, a lot of time agonizing, trying to choose the winners. And so this is what we converged on. Our first place winner, and I should mention that uh, all the uh, prizes uh, will come with a um, cash price and certificate. So the first place, which comes with $500 prize, goes to Valerie Bauman. Can, uh, yeah, I hope everyone joins, uh, congratulating our winners. Uh, uh, the second place, which comes with $250 prize, goes uh, to Suranjoy uh, Singham Singh. And finally, the People's Choice Award, which also goes with, uh, uh, comes with $250 prize, goes to Aden, England. So, uh, yeah, I hope you all joined congratulating the winners, but I should reiterate, there were many student presenters who were really close. So we had big number of excellent presentations. So thank you again, everyone, for participating. And uh, with that, I want to conclude, uh, again, to thank our organizers, uh, presenters, panelists, judges, spectators, and uh, have a nice weekend. <laughs>